I've scored in the top 1% and even top 0.1% of some of the hardest exams in the world, despite going up against some of the best test takers. However, it wasn't always like this. I got middling SAT scores and got rejected from my top choices for college. But using the principles I'll share, I scored in the top 1% of the MCAT, which helped me get into Stanford Medical School. Then I honed them further to score in the top 0.1% of one of the hardest exams in the entire world, USMLE Step 1, which I used to help me match at Harvard MGH for residency. The three key steps I used to score in the top 1% on exams were first, to master what it is that I was learning, second, to make sure that I never forgot what it is that I'd learned, and then third, to learn how to apply that knowledge until I could at least get to my goal score in that particular subject before I moved on to another subject. Step one is to learn it well. The key here is, is to understand that there are different levels of knowledge, and one of the best ways of describing the different levels of knowledge that I know of is what's called Bloom's Taxonomy. At the bottom of Bloom's Taxonomy, you have just remembering it, which is just the basic recall of information. For most standardized exams, this is not going to be enough. The reason is, is that most exams are going to force you to actually use it. They want to see, can you actually apply that information and be able to use it at a higher level? The second step of Bloom's taxonomy is understand, which means you can you comprehend it? The third is apply, which means using the information in new situations. The fourth is analyze, which means you can draw connections among different ideas. The fifth is to evaluate, which means you can justify a standard or decision and the highest level of knowledge or the highest level of understanding something is to create, to produce new or original work. Now, the goal when you're learning something for most standardized exams is to at least reach the level of apply or analyze. But ideally, you wanna strive for the highest level possible, which would include things like create. But what are ways in which you might be able to actually ascend Bloom's taxonomy to learn it at a deeper level? The first technique is one that was popularized by Richard Feynman, which goes by the moniker of the Feynman technique, which is, is that to really understand something, you should be able to explain it to an intelligent third grader, which means you should be able to break down complex ideas into simple enough language so that an intelligent third grader could understand it, explain it back to you, and truly grasp it. Another valuable technique for ascending Bloom's taxonomy is to make sure that you can see it in your everyday life. This is really getting at the idea of application. As an example, one of my friends at Stanford Medical School, he ended up being a neurosurgeon. And one of the ways that I was pretty certain that he was going to achieve his goals was we were going on a run once and there was this period where he was like kind of talking to himself. I was like, that's kind of weird. Like, I wonder what he's saying. When I asked him what it is that he was doing, he said that he was going through all of the different muscles and nerves that had to fire in order for his legs to move the way that they were moving. It was a really good example of how, you know, we were in our first years in medical school, we were learning anatomy and he was just applying it, right? He was using it. Here, you know, I was just sitting there like, oh, I just need to like memorize this information. Like, I just need to know the attachment points. I need to know all of these things that you sort of typically memorize in medical school. He was actually using it. He was thinking like, oh, okay, how can I use this to explain how I'm able to run faster or take longer strides or things like that? It's not surprising that he scored extremely well in his standardized exams and matched at one of the top neurosurgery programs and is making a boatload of money as a spine surgeon right now. So ultimately what he was doing and what I always try to do is to make sure that the knowledge is so deeply ingrained in the way that I see the world that I don't even have to think about it and I don't even have to recall it. This is really one of the things that separates top performers from just average test takers because they've truly changed the way that they see the world, right? When they look at a question, they're looking at it from the lens of a physicist. If you're taking, say, like the MCAT and you've got like the physics section, right? They're not just trying to cram all of these equations. They're actually looking at it through the lens of someone who understands it at a really, really deep level. It's the same thing for the USMLEs. It's the same thing even for something like the SATs, right? If you can learn something so well that it changes the way that you see the world, you've understood it at a level where it becomes difficult for you not to score in the top 1%. So the second step is once you've gotten to the point where you can understand it so well, you want to make sure that you never ever forget it. I think one of the best ways of describing the benefits of never forgetting something is the knowledge equation. This is something that I came up with to model out the maximum knowledge that you can retain of something. And this is actually just derived from the equation for an asymptote. But the idea is, is that the maximum of anything, including knowledge in this case, is the amount that you will learn per day divided by the percent that you're going to forget every day. So let's think about this equation. There's really just two parts to this. In order to maximize the knowledge that you have, you can either A, increase the amount that you learn per day, which is important. B, you can decrease the percentage that you forget. And what I can tell you from experience is, is that while 
all of us are going to try to increase the amount that we study per day and the number of questions, the number of pages and things like that. The easiest way and the fastest way to improve your knowledge is actually to make sure that you just don't forget the things that you've learned. Wouldn't it be great if you just never ever forgot what it is that you learned? is possible. And in order to do so, let's talk about spaced repetition. Spaced repetition is based on work that was done by a man named Herman Ebbinghaus in sort of like the late 19th century. What he tried to figure out was basically what every single student would love to know, which is how can you maximize what it is that you can remember using the fewest number of repetitions and the fewest number of views. He would make these strings of nonsense syllables and he'd figure out how long did it take for him to forget it. And so what he found is, is that for the first time that he learned something, he might forget it in about say like a day. But if he would review that information within that first day, that he might forget it then after two or three days. And then if during that three day period, he would review it again, then maybe it would be like up to a week. And that every single time that he would review it, the amount of time that it took for him to forget it would increase. At the time, this was obviously something that was very important. However, with the advent of computers, this has become something that has allowed people to vastly increase the amount that they can recall. So I use a tool called Anki, but there's a lot of programs that use spaced repetition um, in a flashcard system so that you never forget the things that you have put into these flashcards. As a personal example, I've done this for the last 15 years and everything important in the last 15 years I put into flashcards. But And because the system is so efficient at showing you the things that you're going to forget forget and so that you can keep retaining it, I have made more than 20,000 flashcards, but in order to remember that information, I only have to review maybe a hundred of them per day, which takes me maybe 20 to 30 minutes. So what this means is, is that if you look at the knowledge equation, you can drastically improve the maximum knowledge that you have, which essentially can become limitless because the percentage that you're going to forget of your knowledge every single day approaches zero. And as that approaches zero, the maximum amount that you can learn is virtually infinite. Obviously there's going to be limits to this, um, but what it means practically is, is that you can dramatically improve how much you retain, which can dramatically improve your score. Because if you just never forget what it is that you learn, you have a huge advantage over everyone else that's gonna take the test. The third step is, is that you have to learn how to apply it. So obviously learning how to apply it involves doing a lot of practice questions. There's a lot of studies that show that the more questions that you do, the higher your score will tend to be. That just makes sense. Practice makes perfect, but also it's critical to remember the wise words of John Dewey, who said, we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. So in other words, just doing more questions does not necessarily mean that you're going to get higher scores if you don't use those questions to guide your preparations. And this is where I see a lot of people make mistakes. You need to do more practice questions. And as you're doing those practice questions, you need to actually figure out why is it that you're missing them? The reason I say this is because is in my experience for myself and for students that I coach, oftentimes up to 50% of the questions that someone misses actually have nothing to do with how much knowledge they have. As a consequence, you need to have a systematic approach for analyzing your mistakes to figure out where are the errors that you're making and how can you fix them. The common issues that go beyond just knowledge are things like people will very often just misunderstand the question that's being asked. For example, for one of the tests that I help students prepare for, the USMLE Step 1, they oftentimes will think that the question is asking them something really, really specific, but in reality, it's actually a concept. The same thing happens a lot on the MCAT for things like physics or chemistry, right? If you've ever seen those questions that are like, you know, a gun was shot, uh, you know, horizontally from five feet or, like up from the ground, how long does it take for the bullet to hit the ground? If, you know, assuming there's no error resistance or things like that. Now you might think, oh my gosh, like this is so complicated. Oh, this is like about a bullet question. I've got to think about like the forward, you know, momentum and all these things. But really, in reality, the question is asking, do you understand conservation of energy? Can you go from potential energy to kinetic energy? Another mistake that people will make is, is that they're just not reading carefully enough. So they'll rush through it and they might miss important information either in the question stem or in the actual question itself. Or maybe they will anchor on a particular answer choice and they won't consider the other answer choices because the first one seemed like reasonable enough. Whatever it is, you need to develop a system for identifying and fixing those gaps. So what I did is I would go through every single block of questions that I took and 
I would identify all the questions I got wrong or even the questions that I was like unsure of and I would chart them and I would say, okay, well, I had to learn how to be objective, but I would say like, what exactly was the reason that this was so hard? What exactly was the reason that I missed this, right? Was it because I didn't know something? In which case I would try to master it better and I would make flashcards in it to make sure that I would never forget it. Or I would look at it and I would say, oh, okay, well, I got this wrong because I just, I, I didn't understand how to read this graph or I didn't read the question carefully enough or something like that. When I coach students, I see the same problem. Let's say it was a question about diabetes, but really it was a question about interpreting a graph about diabetes. Their actual challenge is that they just didn't know how to read the graph. You've got to figure out like, if your problem is reading the graph, you need to learn how to read the graph better. Right? This is a really important point that when you study something, you need to make sure that your studying actually matches the thing that you are missing. These are the principles. How do I actually implement this so that I can score in the top 1% or top 0.1% on whatever exam it is that I'm working on? One of the best quotes on this is, I prefer to play games where if I wait, I win. What this means is, is that you want to study in such a way where your success is virtually inevitable. You want to set up a system where your consistent effort is going to guarantee your eventual success. You might not control exactly when it might happen, but you know that if you do the right thing, it will eventually happen, right? Your success will be inevitable. Let's say that I knew that to score in the top 1% on an exam, I needed to score say 85% or 90%. Whatever that score is, you need to figure out where you need to land. When you start, what I actually recommend is, is that you start and do practice questions on the thing that you're learning at that moment. Because what you want to do is, is you want to make sure that you can get at least to that target score in whatever it is that you're studying. So if I'm studying, say, for the MCAT, I want to score at least 85 or 90 percent if I want my overall score to be 85 or 90 percent before I move on. This is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is, is that they're like, well, you know, I've got this much material and I've got this much time. So I need to, you know, cover, I, I need to do all of physics in like a week and I need to do all of biochemistry in like, you know, four days and whatever, right? The problem is, is that they end up moving so fast that they don't learn it well. They don't have good flashcards. They're not actually, you know, able to retain that information. And so their knowledge is going to be capped and their score is ultimately going to be capped. Instead, you want to play a game where if you wait, you win. It might take you a while, right? But if you can get to 90% on that subject before you move on and you make really good flashcards and you never, ever forget that information, you're doing whatever flashcards are due every single day, then you'll just keep adding to this, right? So it's like you can get that physics subtopic to 90% and then you move on to the next physics subtopic and then you get that to 90% and then you just keep doing that and you keep stacking those wins until eventually it's inevitable that you are going to reach your goal, right? The other major benefit of this is, is that if you can solve a problem once, it proves that you can solve it again. In my experience, the hardest thing to do is, is to get to 90% one time. If you can get to 80% or 90% that first time, you've got to solve a lot of different problems, right? You've got to solve those problems of reading things inattentively. You've got to solve the problems of not really understanding what the question's asking you. You've got to solve the problems of knowledge and you've got to solve some of the problems of retention, right? And so there's a lot of problems that you need to solve. And once you've solved them once, either A, you don't need to solve them again because you already have a system, hopefully, that you can use to apply to the other problems that you're going to have in the future, or B, if you solved it once, it will most likely make it easier for you to solve it again for any other subject. And as long as you're using spaced repetition to make sure that you never forget that knowledge, your score is just an inevitable byproduct of the amount of time that you're spending doing this mastery. I think where a lot of people fall short is that they fall into the trap of the tyranny of speed. So what do I mean by this? The company 3M has a saying where you can choose speed, you can choose quality, or you can choose cost but you can only choose two of those three things. I think for studying for exams, it's kind of the same thing. You've got to choose two of the three of the following, either high quality learning, meaning you get to 80 or 90% on whatever it is that you're learning, two, you get comprehensive coverage, meaning you can cover everything, or three, you can get speed, right? You can choose two of those three things. The challenge is, is that most people default to prioritizing speed due to external deadlines or other things, and then they'll choose one of the other two things. Either they'll choose to go really, really in depth on things and they'll, they'll only cover like a tiny amount of the material, or they'll say like, okay, well, I've got this much time and I've got this much I need to cover. They'll just speed through a bunch of material and not really learn it well, and their scores will stagnate at a really low level. Instead, ask yourself, right? Do I wanna play a game where maybe I win, maybe I don't, but I, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to meet a particular deadline? Or do I wanna play a game where eventually I'm going to win? I might not 
I, I might not be able to control exactly when I reach my goal, but as long as I learn it well and I never forget it and I learn how to apply it, and I can get that 80 to 90% or whatever score it is that I need every single time I learn something, then I can eventually get my goal. I just have to just keep learning more things. What I found is, is that typically, the deeper you understand something, the faster it is to learn something else that's related to it. And so it sounds like you're, you're making this really big trade off of like, oh, okay, you know, in order to have quality, you have to sacrifice speed. But in reality, I've actually found that the deeper you learn something, the faster it is that you're able to move through the material. But ultimately, if you wanna figure out how long it's gonna take you to reach your goal, all you've gotta do is figure out how long does it roughly take you to get to 90% or whatever the goal is, is that you're trying to reach, and then figure out how many subjects do you need to reach that in, in order to get your goal. Obviously, you want to build in some sort of a buffer zone, but typically, that's what I do when I'm studying for my exams, is I just say, okay, well, like, what goal do I need? How many subjects do I need to reach mastery in? And I just reverse engineer how long it's going to take for me to reach that goal. So again, the key steps for me to score in the top 1% and top 0.1% on some of the most difficult exams in the world were that first, I had to learn it really, really well. Second, I wanted to make sure that everything I learned, I didn't forget. And third, I had to learn how to apply it effectively until I got my goal score on that subject before I moved on. I hope you can see that by following these steps, you can achieve dramatically higher scores in whatever exam that you're studying. We've literally had students who've gone from failing on some of the USMLEs, which is the bottom 3%, to in a matter of you know two or even three months, going to the top 3% on some of these exact same exams. What's remarkable is, is that it's the same person and they were using the exact same material, but because they transformed their approach, right? Because they made themselves better learners, because they made themselves better test takers, they were able to dramatically improve their scores, despite the fact that they were using pretty much the same materials. If you wanna become a better learner and test taker so you can get excited about taking standardized exams, be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons so you can be notified anytime we drop new content.